Right. It's uh, seven o'clock on June twentieth. Uh, we have our presenter for tonight, uh, Gail Wallen, with the Invasive Species Council of BC. Um, this is uh, we're getting close to two years now. I would say we're a year and three quarters for the conservation webinar series, where we talk about issues and bring in experts um, like Gail to talk about issues that are germane to our membership and to the public at large related to the sustainability of fish, wildlife, and habitat. Uh, so this one is same format as all the others. Um, Gail's presentation will probably be 20 to 30 minutes. Then we'll go into Q&A. If you're coming in from Zoom, um, please use the Q&A button. We'll kind of collate a number of the questions and ask them to Gail. If you're coming in on Facebook, please add your questions in the, in the comment section and uh, we'll have Philippe send them over my way and we'll get them to Gail. And then we'll do, you know, 15, 20 minutes uh, or even a half hour of Q&A, depending on how excited everyone is tonight. Uh, so um, I'll just quickly introduce Gail. Uh, she served as the executive director with the Invasive Species Council of BC for over 15 years. She's volunteered her time with the Canadian Council for over 10 years. Uh, as a professional facilitator and educator, Gail is passionate uh, about building partnerships that help protect habitats. And this is a big one, I would say, for all of us, um, everywhere from your aquarium to your yard. Uh, I know certainly on our property, we've got tons of invasive species and non-native species. And even when we're trying to do all of our controlled burns, we're continually running into major issues and concerns and risks around um, invasive plants uh, and even uh, in other species. So, um, Gail, I'll turn it over to you if you'd like to start your uh, presentation. And uh, on behalf of BC Wildlife Federation, really like to thank you for your, uh, for your time tonight. Well, thanks so much for having us and totally thanks for the interest in this topic. There's definitely lots of areas we can partner with. So we're going to start by making sure the screen share works and then uh, if it doesn't, we'll sort that part out with great uh, technical support. Have you got it? Hey, can you see it live? Can you see it full screen? You're live. Looks awesome. Okay. So I can proceed then? Yeah. You can. Okay. Good. First of all, oops, I didn't try the advance button. Okay. All right. Good. So thank you. So sorry for that. Um, so welcome and thanks for joining us in the evening to talk about something that I actually think um, in my career, I've never found a topic that can touch everyone's life. So I'm really pleased to be here with you today. I want to start off by just recognizing that all of us are calling in from the traditional uh, unceded territories of the Indigenous people across BC. I normally call in from the Northern Shewepan Territory in Williams Lake. Today, I'm actually calling in from the Musqueam and Tsleil-Waututh uh, First Nations on the coast. So definitely appreciate this, this opportunity to work with our, our, our fellow nations on the lands that we work and play on. Just want to tell you a little bit about the Invasive Species Council. We're actually the oldest and largest provincial organization in Canada dedicated on invasive species. Um, we were actually started and we actually helped uh, support the growth of other, we call them chapters, fellow chapters across the country. We actually work with the Canadian Council on Invasive Species. And the logic of BC was invasive species don't stop at our borders. Our very first workshop called Weeds Know No Borders. And uh, we all agreed we wanted to work together. So working collaboratively across the country is really important for us. Uh, it's interesting picking up on Jesse's uh, comment about our purpose for working together. Our mission is to build healthy, healthy landscapes, habitats and communities to prevent the spread of invasive species. And what's interesting about invasive species is the majority of them are introduced and spread by people. It's not a, a small pra uh, practi practice, it's the majority of people. I'm gonna go back 15 or 18 years. Today, Jesse, you guys invited us to an invasive species session. 10, 15 years ago, there were so many calls around, what do we call this thing? You know, we call it introduced, non-native, et cetera. These all have different meanings, but the common language from international level to where we're sitting here in BC is now invasive species and it reflects a certain group of, uh, of uh, plants and species that don't traditionally belong here. Uh, just a couple other exotic, yes, exotic meaning they're from away, don't belong here. They're non-native to this area. They'll be native elsewhere. They're introduced, yes, but they're not all introduced species are invasive. It's only a very small percentage. And it's those that have really um, great characteristics at taking over a habitat. 
And the example I often use is we we're our council is totally supportive. We we're not we don't have a role with trying to get rid of all introduced species and crocuses or daffodils I use as an example. They are introduced species, they're not native, they're exotic plants, but they're not invasive. They don't actually take over habitats. Noxious weeds in British Columbia actually refers to a certain percentage of our invasive plants, and those are ones that are regulated. What makes something invasive? And I just thought I'd touch bases here on a few things. One is, is there high seed producers or high reproducers, whether they're by seed or we'll talk about different ways. But if you take, there's a couple of species. If you've ever been on the coast, like down in Vancouver Island, there's two species, Scotch broom and gorse that most people have tripped over, um, ran into, and they may not realize it, but those are really high producing uh, seed plants that produce high high number of seeds. So like gorse will produce eighteen thousand seeds per per year per plant. Well, you take that for a multiplying factor and establishing how well that can become established. When you take a, another example of purple loosestrife, this is a plant that we intentionally planted. Gorse, by the way, was intentionally planted with a touch of the old country brought over. I was working with golf course uh, superintendents uh, 10 years ago, and it was intentionally being planted on golf courses on Vancouver Island to keep people on the fairways. Well, this is now today with today's knowledge, these are plants that we don't want planted. But purple loosestrife, very prolific, um, 3 million seeds per plant. And the reason these are invasive plants is because they can reduce or reproduce so quickly and knock out the native ecosystems. I'm gonna give you a couple other examples. Hound's tongue, and if you're not familiar with hound's tongue, you might be familiar with uh, burdock, but these are ones that um, reproduce, but they also have the, the burr factor to be able to spread quickly. And I'll be talking later on about, you know, what we can do differently. And when you take a, a plant like hound's tongue, or when you take a plant like burdock, these actually attach to people, pets, tires, et cetera, and move very quickly. Um, knapweeds, if you're in the interior, you will have definitely seen knapweeds. There's, we have a number of knapweeds in British Columbia. They are high producers. They have a long, what we call seed bed. They can actually survive, they have a long survival time. You know, this diffuse knapweed plant might drop, you know, thousands of seeds, but those will also be viable over the next 10, 10 15 years. So, and plants like the knapweeds, and this is a real concern to ranchers and people trying to protect our grasslands, it can move so quickly um, along vehicle roadways, ATVs, et cetera. A couple more examples. I mean, here's, a, here's a, when I was preparing today's presentation, it was taking a look at like, why should we care? And what makes invasives bad? Well, this is a really good example. Here's a spot at knapweed. We, we just looked at diffuse knapweed a minute ago. But you can take a look at how it's taken over the entire field there that has no longer got good grazing capabilities for whether it's deer or moose or cattle. It's actually displaced the native ecosystem, displaced, displaced the native uh, grasses. And this plant has a special characteristic, and I always say it wrong, but alleopathy. So it actually has creates a difference in the soil to stop the native plants from growing there. It actually creates a chemical kind of reaction that stops plants, uh, plant other plants from growing there. It creates its own its own growing conditions. I don't know how many tourism pictures I see with beautiful pictures of orange hawkweed in the foreground along a roadway. This is not a native species. This is not one that we want. It has a species like this, you can see already what it's taken over. You can see that was probably disturbed land. You can look up behind it, it was disturbed land. Invasive species often come in behind, behind disturbance and they can come in very fast and rapidly. And because native species tend to be slower growing to establish, if invasive species like orange hawkweed get established in a site after building a road, clearing a land or whatever, it's really difficult to get rid of them because they also don't come with Invasive species come from away and they don't come with the natural predators that keep keep them in check, whether that's an eastern gray squirrel, a goldfish, or orange hawkweed. What you're seeing more of in British Columbia is a use of biocontrol. And biocontrol is the research and study about what is a safe, it takes multiple years to test this, it's collaboration across countries, working with Switzerland, et cetera, to test to make sure that a bioagent won't 
won't move from orange hawkweed onto any native species and it'll be stay focused on this on this species of concern. And so right here you're seeing, you know, you're seeing an example of bio, biocontrol, which is forming galls on that plant. It's a, it's a wasp, it causes the plant to form galls, that plant becomes less prolific, which reduces its population. So biocontrol is a tool in the toolbox to reduce the populations of species that we don't want, and it takes them years to test it. So it's very rigorous before they can be used. I'm going, to, I'm going through these examples because I think uh, uh, for all the folks that are with us online is you may think, well, does this really matter? And I'm trying to give you examples about why it actually really matters to all of us. And all of us will have a role. And that's where I'm going to end with and totally open to taking your questions. There's a few species that I'm particularly passionate about. Knotweed is one. Um, and so you see an example here of this knotweed growing up um, through cement. I've taken people on road trips and we've actually used machetes to cut into patches of, of knotweed. I've, we've actually seen knotweed coming up through the roads. If you're in England, you actually have difficulty getting a mortgage if you have knotweed on your property because it, it is so aggressive. Um, so there's an, a really good example. Eurasian milfoil. If you've been in the Okanagan, this is a, a, a real scourge to the Okanagan Lake. So you have an introduced lake, an introduced plant. Um, did you know that if you buy aquarium plants, like we actually ran a sample about eight years ago, we just went and bought plants for, for our aquariums. We brought in an expert to identify all the plants. They were all sold in different names. But every one of the stores that we went to, which was either a, a water garden store or an aquarium store, they, they we have found Eurasian mill, water milfoil in many of those stores. So we're selling it. And then, okay, maybe you think you're keeping it in your aquarium and it's okay. But when you dump your aquarium into your local pond, which is illegal, uh, but people do it, you end up with a plant that has no control on it. And it actually overtakes your, your natural lakes and water bodies. And, you, and now municipalities and governments are working to try to keep the water bodies free so you can boat and swim and you've got good water quality. So it's just another really good example about some of the impacts that you see. Uh, here, here's an example of burdock. I actually, I love burdock. Um, I love to hate burdock, I should say, but burdock, um, here's a picture of a moose. There's lots of pictures over the last couple of years of bats being uh, challenged by burdocks because the burrs, which are very, very prolific on this plant, actually have caused their wings to be attached together and therefore they can't fly. Um, if you have burdock on your cattle, it's actually a hindrance for selling it. So, and I can, I can personally say having burdock on my dog, I do not go to places where there is burdock. It is too hard, too uncomfortable with my dog. And I know too many people that have had to take their dogs into the vet because they've been chewing at the burdock stuck in their paws and they're trying to get it out and ends up in their inside. So, and, but burdock is a great plant. I didn't include a picture of it here, but it's an easy plant to remove. It's easy to identify, easy to remove the seed heads and easy to uh, control it, but it takes a little bit of work. So blue weeds, another example of a, of a species that we don't want. There's a few of them. Blue weed, leafy spurge, oxeye daisy. These are all examples. I mean, if you look at that field there, how much grazing is there in there, do you think, for moose or deer or cattle? So these species, again, greatly displace the native species, but also re reduce the amount of forage that's available for our native species. Okay, riparian and wetlands. I've already talked a little bit about purple loosestrife. There's a, here's another picture of it, just absolutely changing the ecosystem there. And when you, and with any ecosystem in BC, riparian are really, riparian and water bodies are really balanced. There's a natural ecosystem. There's a natural cycle of life. There's everything from uh, young fish, older fish, insects, et cetera. You just, you change that normal, habitat, you're actually influencing all the other critters that live in that habitat. So when you see purple loosestrife like this, and purple loosestrife has been a plant in sale, we're, we're, we all of us are working together to make sure it's not currently sold anymore and it's not planted. Yellow fly gyrus has been sold recently, and it's a beautiful plant. Many invasive plants, over 60% have been planted intentionally, 
are beautiful because they're exotic, they look different, but people don't realize the impacts they have. So again, really big impacts from uh, when you're introducing species like this and they'll take over your habitat, reduce the um, habitat for your young fry, et cetera. Remember, I've already said that most of our, in our invasive plants have been intentionally introduced. Cordgrass is an, a really good example, brought in in the 80s, brought in, they thought it'd be a good grazing crop, give stability. I was at a meeting not five plus years ago with a major corporation was saying, we're gonna plant cordgrass because it's gonna stabilize our, our shorelines and our uh, I'm going, hold on, let's talk. Let's talk about what other options you have. And plants like this, will overtake your, your, your lands and they will reproduce in many ways. So we talked earlier about like burdock or uh, producing by seeds and they can move with this. These plants like this can produce by their rhizomes or their roots, it's, which means if you wanna remove it, you gotta get all the rhizomes, you gotta get all the roots out, you've gotta remove all the seeds because this plant has, this plant like many invasive species reproduces in many different ways. And I'm just, here's some really good examples of just uh, some examples about how it actually displaces your, na your natural um, coastline, your, sh your shorelines. And there's actually is a native Spart uh, Spartina here in BC. And so there's work being done, uh, provincial governments doing, and with partners like Ducks and maybe BC Wildlife Fed, I'm not sure, working to identify where is Spartina, where can we control and eradicate it so it doesn't spread up our our coastlines further and we can still protect those really important intertidal uh, nursery nursery areas because intertidal areas is such a rich area for the reproduction of the coastal shoreline. Here's another plant, here's another species. I really, it's, it's, a, it's a really prolific species. Um, it's established in many continents in, in, across the world. Probably came here in the very late nineties uh, lots of debate about how it got here, but it moves fairly easily with, with tides. Uh, many, many uh, marine and be it fresh or coastal are actually helped along by, by ballast water and by ships that are shipping um, different areas. So this, you can see the current distribution um, of the European grid crab and you go, okay, why do we care? Well, this, first of all, it doesn't belong here. It's very prolific. It, it will compete with your native crabs and will out, out eat many of your native species there. So it's actually provide, taking over the habitat and the food supply that supports your native species. Um, here's a eel, if, you, if you're a coastal person, you'll know that the eelgrass meadows are actually a really important nursery ground for many different things. And the European green crab, is actually one, and here's a picture of it actually destroying um, that actual eel, eel grass. And those eel grasses, even without European green crabs, are already on the decline um, in the in the salt marine area. And so, when you add in a Europe, when you add an invasive species like European green crab, you're actually you're actually causing that to increase the decline of that um, eel grass meadow. So I, I put this up here, and I'm going to show you some examples afterwards. But when you're looking at these invasive species, you don't have to be an expert at knowing all about them. If you're a coastal person, you might want to know about European green crab. There's lots of information that we have online. Our organization and others, uh, uh, Fisheries and Oceans, has lots of information on European green crab. But And there's actually a way they're encouraging people to become reporters and monitors for European green crab so we can have a better idea where the distribution is and where it's spreading to. Okay. This has got to be my favorite uh, species to speak to because I have not met anybody yet in British Columbia that can't relate to a goldfish. You've either had a goldfish, your friend had a goldfish, or you've looked at goldfish in the store. So far, I'm 100% on that. So when I'm talking to audience that know nothing about invasive species, it's an easy place to start with goldfish. And the goldfish that you see on the, my right-hand side is a typical goldfish when you've been released into the environment. Well, you, uh, goldfish actually belongs to the carp family. And, the, and these species stay, this uh, goldfish stays small when it's in that little tiny container on your, your, your counter. But when you release it out to a bigger container or into the, your pond, by the way, that's illegal. 
is it actually will grow in size. It will actually start to lose its orange color. So you can see size of a football is the analogy we often use. So goldfish are not good for eating. They're not a good uh, uh, fish for fishing for. I've hauled uh, tanks of goldfish. They're actually extremely smelly and very slimy, more so than other fish. Um, but these goldfish are amazing animals. They can survive basically no auction. They have the ability, Dr. Brian Heise out of Thompson Rivers University has done lots of work on this. And basically they're, they can turn their, they have a system in their body whereby they can survive without auction because they actually are able to turn their, what I would call blood into something like a, uh, an alcohol. So they're actually can survive with no auction and freezing temperatures over winter. So super, super um, successful at survival. They can reproduce sexually, they can reproduce asexually. Um, and I'm from Williams Lake. If you wanna take a look at some amazing footage, take a look at the Dragon Lake, uh, where some volunteers are trying to reduce the populations of, of goldfish in, there, in Dragon Lake. The challenge with any, any invasive, aquatic invasive, we have very little tools in Canada to deal with it. And we have to be very careful because we also protect our important waters. I just wanted to mention a couple other, uh, and I know maybe some of the people are, are going, I really like smallmouth bass, or I like northern pike, um, or yellow perch. All of these species are introduced, they don't belong to British Columbia, and they're actually, or to, to most of British Columbia, and they're actually competing with the native fish. And we have them because they've been intentionally released in. So when, again, just like when we talked about purple loosestrife, or we talk about goldfish, all of these species when introduced into the environment are competing for the food supply, the shelter, the habitats that our native species provide. So it's a competition factor. All right. And this is probably uh, one of the hot topics right now, which is feral pigs. First of all, what do you call it? Do you call it a wild boar? Do you call it a feral pig? Do you call it an invasive? Uh, pig or boar. Lots of debate on what these are being called. Lots of debate across Canada and the states about the, the correct term. Doesn't really matter. They're pigs that are outside a fence that aren't allowed to be there. And back in the 70s and 80s on the prairies, um, 90s, we actually had encouraged bringing in, because we were looking to diversify our agriculture, and we encouraged people to bring in boars, just like they had in Europe, etc., and so there's actually a hybrids between the, the boars and with the uh, domestic pigs. What we don't know, what we didn't know is that these are actually really robust. So today, the invasive pigs, call them what, what you want, are across North America recognized as the most prolific and highly invasive large mammal that we've got, bar none. And there's work in Canada, um, definitely in Canada, to try to get a control of our wild pig population before it comes too big. And in British Columbia, to make sure we don't become, don't have established populations of pigs. Both, both of those are important. So why do we care about wild pigs? Okay, they don't belong in the landscape. They're very destructive. You can see a pig there of eating the, the crops. I can just show you a couple other examples. Um, so here, the, these pigs, I thought I had another, uh, yeah, let me just jump to this one for now. Here's some of the damage that they'll do to, to lands. Just a really good example, they're rooters. And so they can cause a lot of damage to your grasslands or your farms or your ranches. Um, and what we don't see is they actually have the ability to carry a lot of diseases. There's a number of diseases that come. The one of concern is the American, is the African swine fever which if they carry that and introduce that into our domestic pig population, we actually have a trade issue because the African swine uh, fever would actually close our borders. Both cattlemen and pork producers are concerned about this because of the trade implications we'll ha have to us. So I just wanna go back. Um, so feral pigs um, are an issue. We have in British Columbia, a number of reports every year and the approach in British Columbia is that the conservation officers or the uh, provincial enforcement officers will take action to help get that pig back inside the fence. Um, pigs, once they're out, will reproduce. Um, they can have two litters per year. 
each female pig can have 10 to 12 piglets per, per litter. So you can see they can reproduce quite, quite quickly, quite well. And therefore what started as one or two pigs outside the fence ends up being very quickly a multiplying factor, particularly when your pigs mature quickly and can reproduce. So pigs, wild pigs will end up forming groups called sounders. And sounders is, is that group of pigs that travels across the landscape. Um, in the caribou and the Chicotan, their first thought was they'll never overwinter. Well, they'll easily overwinter. We've had reports um, and sightings in the Peace, in the North, in the Chicotan, et cetera. They've been reported over the years in Vancouver Island and the Kootenays and the, and the Okanagan. So we do have an issue with feral pigs. The challenge with any invasive species is you never know how many you've got almost until it's too late. And I'll show you some graphs on that in a bit. But what we want to do is make sure that we have our feral pigs, that we remove them when we when they're first sighted. We don't want them to become established on our land base because we don't want, if you want to take a look at it, where the damage is done, take a look at Texas. Um, there's lots of damage in lots of states that have it. Saskatchewan has a major problem with uh, wild pigs, but they were an agriculture province. They brought them in, so they've got a major problem with it right now. So what do we do with feral pigs if we find them? Um, the challenge is feral, feral pigs, if you have a sounder group of 10, 20 pigs that are traveling together and you take out one of them, it will, it will cause that sounder group to split into three or four sounders, smaller sounders and they'll become more secretive. They're very, pigs are intelligent. And so the rule for uh, pigs is you need to take out the, capture the full sounder. There's a lot of different ways they do this. I just use a, a suspended trap here as one example. Uh, they, they trap them from the air. They've got traps, a number of different ground traps they bring them in. But the goal is for pig management is to get the full sounder in, not just part of them. Otherwise, you're causing a disbursement factor. And like with any invasive, we talked about burdock and purple loose strife and some other examples and how they spread. Well, feral pigs will spread by breaking up their sounders. So there's two ways we get feral pigs in the landscape. One is escape pigs, I guess three ways. Escape pigs by uh, livestock owners not having them well enough contained. Two, there have been intentional, I'm not saying in BC, there have been intentional releases of pigs. And then three is the, the splitting of the sounders and having them go. So I know that there's a real, I mean, I've handled so many calls from hunters saying, tell me, I'll go get that pig. But the question isn't, it's not probably just one pig. It might be three pigs. It might be five pigs. And so you need to take the whole group out, not part of them. And so that's why, you know, there's, uh, there's some different approaches across Canada on how to deal with it. But from a science side, from a management side, whole sounder or none at all, get the whole sounder and contain them. Yeah, I'm, I'm going through this a little bit faster than I planned, but uh, um, give us a little bit more time for, for questions. You can just see the damage. I mean, uh, where I live in the Chocotan, where we've had damage, it's, you know, like it's a long damage and you have the issue of them carrying uh, viruses and the Af African swine fever. Okay, I'm gonna talk on a couple that we don't have here yet. Um, just looking for the time on this clock. Um, uh, Philip, can you just put the time in the, in the chat box, please? If I can see it, oops, sorry. Um, okay, here's some species we don't have, is zebra or quagga mussels. If you've traveled across BC, we know that you will have, a wa you've seen the, there, will, there is mandatory boat inspection stations managed by the province. That means if you have a boat, kayak, canoe, you must pull over and be inspected. And that's because we don't want zebra and quagga mussels in our waters. And we've had some close calls. We've had definitely every year, there's boats that come into British Columbia that are infested with zebra or quagga mussels or their young stage, which is called villagers, which they grow, the villagers are, are the young stage. And they're actually in the, um, they're actually in the um, water of your ballast water or whatever. So we want to keep them out because once they're in, there's very little to do to be able to control them. Like in the aquatic world, we don't have tools and chemicals that we can use because we're protecting our water. Yellow starthus. So th that's a really good example. They are now in Lake Winnipeg. 
And when we look at uh, the province manages this boat control program, and when they're coming across, we know that they're stopping the boats and there's more boats coming into BC that are infested with zebra quagga mussels or have been in zebra quagga mussel waters coming from Eastern Canada than there is coming up from the States. They used to come from the States. Now they're coming, they're, they're still come from the States, but there's a higher percentage coming from the, from the East. Yellow star thistle. It's funny, I mentioned scotch broom and, and gorse earlier. Well, scotch broom and, uh, and gorse and yellow star thistle all have a unique characteristic besides being invasive. They're actually all highly flammable. And by being highly flammable, they're actually a risk to our communities if you've got these species around us. We do not have yellow star thistle in British Columbia yet. It's south of the border. We don't want it. Highly flammable. High, it definitely produces a... a, a, it's a really aggressive producer. And like the other plants that I told you about it, I'm going to say it again, allopathic uh, characteristics where it stops other uh, species from coming in. When you take a look at something like zebra mussels, just for zebra quagga mussels, the province just released a report that was saying they predict that the damages caused by these mussels will be 129 million per year. So again, the secret to invasive species is to keep them out to avoid the economic losses and to avoid, avoid the environmental damage. Spotted lanternfly. This is a huge issue for, for fruit, wine growers, et cetera. And BC's got a really robust agriculture sector. Um, this is creeping its way both north and west in the states. There's definitely a number of um, states that have it on the eastern border. And there's a high alert and there's actually what we call a community science network where we're getting people to be on the alert and report in any potential lanternfly uh, spottings. And that's so that we can be more proactive on it. Uh, we work a lot with the community science side, and that's basically because for invasive species, you need to get them when there's only one or two or 10 or 20, not when there's hectare after hectare of it. Another good example of a species we don't have established here, but was found here uh, a few years ago, the Northern Giant Hornet. And this species, very large. We handle so many calls on this every year. It gets mixed up with many uh, native species. Um, this is much larger, very distinct looking. And there was action taken on it right away due to a collaborative effort. It was found uh, south of Nanaimo area. It was found by alert people. So the beekeepers worked with the province to take the 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 home out they're not traditional hives they were in the ground and ever since then there's actually been a very major um, alert and awareness out for reporting northern giant hornet before they become established there have been we have not had any more confirmed sightings of northern giant hornet in a natural environment we we do we know they've been in washington and i haven't heard the reports for this year but we're hoping it'll be zero so I want to I want to move. So the, I just wanted to touch bases on um, just a little bit of a general overview on sort of what are some of the invasive species that that you could be aware of. But I really wanted to stress that it is that they're all things that you can make a difference on, and that's because it, it, invasive species, as I said already, are intentionally introduced. So let me just wrap up with uh, a few slides here about what you can do, and then we'll go from there. Okay. My computer will work. There it goes. So invasive species have four stages. Prevention is by far, let's prevent them coming in because that's the cheapest way. It's the most effective way. Once we're, they're in, you want to eradicate that small population that you've got before it becomes established. If you can't eradicate it, then you want to contain it. So the logic being, let's contain it. We'll only have goldfish in this lake. Let's make sure it's not moved every, any place else, which means you have to make sure that nobody else introduces them. And then if you can't detain, contain it, then you're looking at long-term management and you're looking at annual losses and annual cost. What can we do? We can all make a difference. Uh, it, it's, a, it's pretty interesting to see how invasive species are moved. Over 60% of our plants are intentionally planted. Many of our invasive species, and here's a really good map, scentless chamomile. Um, now, if you didn't know anything about BC, you might not be able to guess what that is, but those are our highway routes. You're going to see that our invasive plants are tend to be trended along where we move with our trucks, vehicles, ATVs, et cetera. 
I've also shown a really good picture. We looked at uh, Eurasian male for earlier, but here's a really good example about how you can move from one lake body to another lake body. So that's why we call for the, uh, the, the campaigns that we operate with, more than willing to work with you folks online, is play clean, go. Let's make sure our cars, tires, tenting, uh, boots are all clean, play clean, go. And let's make sure that our boats are clean, drain, dry. Let's make sure we don't have any water in there to move muscles or other bodies from one to the next. All of us need to be involved. We need to all be able to identify and take action. So there's two ways to do that. One of them is a free app called Report Invasives. It will help you. You can report what you see. It doesn't, you know, they might say, okay, we already know this goes into government, actually. We already know there's not weed there, but it actually adds knowledge to that database that there's not weed there. So take a photo, submit the report. The other thing that um, many people use is iNaturalist. Let's you, gain a free app. It's called iSpy Identify. And you can, that's our program, our project. So click on that, join our project, and then just go out and shoot pictures. We don't care whether they're native or not native, because all that adds to the inventory. So I wanted to wrap with my section, and then I'll take some questions, is um, as I started off with, all of us have a role, and I think we can all make a difference. These are just some of the examples today that I've shared with you that have a huge impact to our habitats. We all have a role. We can all make a difference. There's definitely more research needed so we know how to control an invasive species before we get involved. But if you want to find out more, we've got a website, bcinvasives.ca, more than willing to work with you, any of you and your organizations about sharing more. So back to you, Jesse. Awesome. Great job, Gail. Thank you very much. I got a couple of questions that are already queued up. And then if... Uh... Folks have any other questions, they can put them into the uh, Q&A um, or on Facebook in the comments. And Gail, yeah, it's 736, so we're good. good. Um, first one, are the feral pigs placed back on farms or are they euthanized? It'll it'll depend. That government will work with the uh, where those pigs come from, but it is illegal, illegal to have pigs outside of a fence. So if you're gonna have your pig come back, you're gonna to have to contain it in its fence. If there's uh, sounders that are removed or sometimes we don't know where pigs have come from and they're rambling out there. So one of the approaches that they, one of the approaches they use is to euthanize them. Thank you. Um, another question on Vancouver Island, English ivy is creating ecological deserts on the ground layer, Douglas fir forests and climbing trees. Local nurseries are still selling it. Is there any effort to create laws that prevent the sale of invasive species? Awesome. Yes, English ivy used to cover uh, emp the empress there, but it does a lot of damage to your building and people don't realize that, but it can, it can kill trees. It can actually smother large trees, cover your sheds. And yet we bought, many of us have bought it over the years. It's in many hanging baskets. So we work with many the retailers uh, and growers to grow alternative plants to um, English ivy. And there's many good examples. So if you go into garden works, Nats Nursery, et cetera, they'll give you other species other than ones that are, we've got a program called Grow Me Instead. We've worked with the industry. Here's plants that were in sale, like English ivy, like uh, baby's breath, et cetera. What are good, safe alternatives? So we've worked with them. So it's a, it's a certification program. We're also working with government. Government's regulations are very outdated. And yes, it'd be nice if they were listed, but while we're waiting for government to catch up, we can all be wise gardeners. So check out PlantWise, don't buy it. But we can, it's easy to pull English ivy. Protect your, your trees. You can pull it back. Awesome. Uh, another one, I've heard spotted knapweed can cause cattle to miscarry. Is this correct? And if so, what's the impact on other mammals? Well, that's a really interesting question. I don't know that. I know spotted knapweed uh, is not highly palatable to a lot of cattle. So I don't know that. I'd have to get back. But it's not one that they like to eat. And maybe that's why they don't like to eat it. Thanks, Gail. Um, here we go. Looks like we got some on Facebook. If I were to see feral pigs in the wild, what is the best route of action? Report it. So you can report it to the RAP line, uh, which you're probably all familiar with. So that's one thing. If uh, if you don't know the RAP line, you can report it into us. We will take it into the RAP line and into government for reporting. So it's important to take to report it and to report any suspect sightings for anything, whether it's feral pigs or um, goldfish 
because then it can be confirmed whether we actually have it. Feral pigs are a high priority for government. There's a big campaign on called Squeal on Pigs. We're just working, I've got a meeting tomorrow. We're rolling out a campaign in our organization with all of our partners to get more increased reporting on pigs. Right, and um, I'll pull up the Wildlife Act, but I guess the other best thing to do is to check the um, hunting regulations around Schedule D wildlife. I guess it would be the best thing. Well, let me let me. So it is legal if you have a hunting license and you're on property that you are like legally allowed to hunt on. You are legally allowed to hunt feral pigs in BC. However, I'll remind you that hunting feral pigs in BC and taking out that one or two pigs can be really disruptive and split that sounder. So this is a really tough challenge for hunters. I I've deal with lots of calls from hunters who want to hunt them, but we wanna encourage them to work with partners to make sure we take out the full sounders. And we just had a feral pig workshop in collaboration with BC Wildlife Fed to talk about that challenge about how can we make sure we're not dispersing pigs on the landscape. So yes, they are legal to hunt, but report them too. If, even if you're gonna hunt them, and, and split the sound or at least let us know that you're hunting them so we know where they're at. Okay, and a follow-up on feral pigs. Is their meat um, good for consumption? Is it edible? Yep. Yes, my understanding is that feral pigs are good for consumption. So that's one of the things when we've talked to other partners is, is this a really good food source for our people who are needy? Can we make sure that if we're taking out a group of sounders because it's the right thing to do from the environment side, can these have a win providing good food? But there's lots of rules from the food side about what you can do as you folks would well know, when and how you can handle wild meat, which uh, uh, a pig now is wild meat, so. Gotcha. Um, okay, we're out of questions, but I have a question for you. Okay. Go for it. Uh, one of our areas that we're looking at for ecosystem restoration, we are seeing a lot of cheatgrass and there's a lot of concern. And I know they're doing a bit of work in the United States, but are you up to speed on any of that? Cheatgrass is a real problem. I think you're down in the Okanagan area. So it's, it's super uh, fragile ecosystems, really important for different species. And you're watching this cheatgrass come north um, and it's changing the ecosystem displacing native species, displacing species at risk, and yet we're not doing enough on it uh, because it's got the risk of spreading. And it's right now we're in fire season and it's super flammable. So it, it's displacing our native ecosystems and having any huge impact. Should we do more? Absolutely. We should be doing more on it and many and not weed. I mean, just using a couple of examples. Yeah, and are you, are you up to speed on any of the... Um on any of the work that's gone on there's been lots of discussion around herbicides and also around fertilization are you, is that is that on your radar yet it's not happening in canada i know that so no i'm not um but for most invasive so I'm totally open to to following up and getting back to you with more but cheatgrass like and for most invasive species there's a suite of tools you don't want just one tool you need a suite of tools to address it so you've talked it's probably you've talked about fires herbicides what was the other one you mentioned uh, jesse uh, so uh, herbicide, yeah. they have a herbicide in the States that's been approved, it's not approved in Canada, and then fertilization is, is another one. So the same thing when you're looking at even nap weeds, et cetera, is there's a, there's a lot of work being done um, to, if we can we change the nutrient loading on, on the soil that will uh, actually retard the, the spread of the invasive species and help the natural grasses come back. So there's lots of work on that. Um, there's times and places you need all the tools in the toolbox and and knowing the habitat that you're in. So I'm not, I can get find out more for anybody that's interested on that. Awesome. Uh, I got another one. Any research on which tough, aggressive native plants can be replanted into areas where invasives have been removed, leaving empty ground, you know, invites invasives back? So a couple things on native is there any work on which native plants to plant? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I think what, what I think what the they're asking is there are there some species that can outcompete um, invasives that we can put back into the ground? I think that's the question. Okay, so that's interesting. I was actually just walking grasslands last week with uh, a number of technical experts about what can we do with our grasslands. Exactly that question. How can we do we replant with 
native species. And but how how can you do that? Native species are slow grow, slower growing traditionally. They're more costly. Can we plant it with plugs? Can we restore riparian areas with with plugs? What's it going to cost per plug? And how big does it have to be before we can plug it? Can plant it successfully? So there are native nurseries in in British Columbia, and there's native seed producers in British Columbia. They're limited, but the challenge is most invasive species are way more prolific and aggressive than native species. So the real question I think has to come into is it, which is more important? Do you want to replace it with a native species in the next two years? Maybe it's in the next 20 years. If you can re regain a bit of a healthier ecosystem using some non-invasive species, and this was our conversation, I'll use your English ivy area. English ivy will crawl across everything, but maybe you can use some other plants and not as aggressive, they may not be native, uh, but if they're less aggressive and you can use that as a seed bed, as a starting point for some native species over time. So diversity is important in for all habitats and invasive species usually hinder diversity because they're usually monocultures and you use English ivy or you use knapweed or, or yellow, uh, yellow flag iris. So, my comment would be is lots of work and lots of passion around native species, but native species have a real challenge against aggressive species. I mean, I, a couple of weeks ago, I was looking at Scotch broom, which is right across Vancouver Island. So there's a touch of the old country was brought in, but looking at three-year-old Scotch broom that's six feet tall over top of a three-year seedling, that seedling doesn't have a chance unless we get rid of the scotch broom. And if you just got scotch broom there, you've got no diversity for other species. So there's an example about the tree that's being planted isn't native, but at least it's trying to get another stock covered on there other than scotch broom and it's not succeeding. Hmm. Thanks. Uh, okay. Just made to see so much not weed on our coast, especially where development and construction is taking place. Whole valleys along the coast are covered. Most people uh, I speak with just shrug. What can be done to help developers become aware? Ah, well, come to us. <laughs> so first of all, we actually worked with developers and real estate uh, folks because you need to know what to do with knotweed. Knotweed is one of those species that actually many local governments are actually working and making a difference on it. And that's because that knotweed can actually grow through your infrastructure, grow through your foundation, can have major risk to your buildings. So you need to take care of it. It is, it is a species that generally takes herbicide, which is a big concern, and you can't use herbicides in a riparian area. So it's a complex species to deal with, but we've actually developed a, a guide for realtors and developers. We worked with them together and our training course. Um, here's things to be aware of. Here, if you're looking at a new property or you're buying a property, if you or I are buying a property, here's one of the questions we were trying to get in on that screening list. Is there highly aggressive invasive species on this property? Because I don't particularly want to buy a property with not weed on it that I have to then treat without knowing it. And most of us aren't trained to know it. So we, yes, we working with the developers, there's a big role there. And some development companies actually have uh, operating procedures in place, in place, SOPs in place to deal with not weed. And then local governments have processes in place about where not weed goes to, because the last thing you want to do with any invasive plant is put it in your compost. They are all, not weed is so aggressive. There's lots of research being done on how to dispose of it, but it does not go into your green stream. Or like what we see all over Forest Service roads is people take what they find in their backyard and dump it in the bush. Yeah, and you'd be surprised. We did research a few years ago on how many people drop their planted baskets into yeah. green spaces. And if you're in an urban park and you've dropped that nice garden basket with, uh, you just mentioned English ivy or lamium or baby's breast, those are all examples of what we don't want to see. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Gail. Any tips on removing blackberry bushes? Ah, blackberry is an aggressive plant. Um, you're going to need thick gear to, to remove it. Uh, and some people will argue blackberry is a great plant. Yes, it does produce nice berries. I love blackberry jam. But there are actually other alternatives to Himalayan blackberry, which is our invasive one. Then, So if you're going to plant blackberry, do not plant Himalayan blackberry. If you're going to do it, you're going to have to remove it, roots and all, and you're going to have to discard it in a, in not in the green stream, not in the green stream, and you're going to have to be aggressive about it. But if you take a look, uh, particularly across the Lower Mainland and Vancouver Island, like how many hectares of parks are we losing to blackberry? 
how many green spaces are taken over by this? And again, you don't have any diversity um, because of that. You've displaced it. And it's we can't walk those trails and, and areas unless those are cut back. So yes, there's groups that are volunteer groups that are making a big difference by saying, okay, we're into Blackberry. We're going to remove it. And all across the lower mainland areas, we're seeing that. So good gear, good snippers, and dedication. Thanks. Uh, any resources for people trying to rid a of of backyard pests like burdock, i.e. it's calling the weed people killer people the only way? I don't want bad chemicals in my yard. Okay, so two comments there is burdock actually is a plant that's easy to remove by manual labor. So it's it's a it's got a rootstock that's really clear. You want to cut it, but if if you've already got a seed stock on it, it's a very distinct tall stock. Get rid of that before it reproduces more, but then simply dig it out, bag it, and make sure it doesn't go in the green stream. Uh, the other comment I'll make, and I know not all people like this, but if we are using herbicides, which you don't need for burdock as much as you do for knotweed is when it's used in knotweed, there's a lot of rules about when and how it can be used. And if you don't want to lose your septic system or your water system, unless you're going to be fighting bur or knotweeds for 30 or 40 years, you're probably going to be forced to appreciate the advantages of regulated um, herbicides on that plant. And that's, and you need to make it, it, there's tools and techniques they have about how you use it on knotweeds, but you don't need it for species like burdock. So go to our website, bcinvasive.ca, or drop us a note. And if you're trying to figure out what to do with burdock, we may have a fact sheet on your species of concern. We've got, you know, hundred of them are there or so. And if not, send us a, an email and we'll get info at bcinvasives.ca and we'll get you information on your plan. I know some of the technical experts are on the call today and uh, they'll, they'll be listening. We'll be totally willing to answer those questions. Thanks. Uh, next one, bindweed is a big problem here in the Okanagan. <laughs> it's better to burn once rather than remove uh, removed, burn once removed rather than put it in the municipal compost bin. Okay, well, first of all, never, never, never put in the municipal compost bin. I'd have to uh, get back to them. So if you can take a list of this, maybe we can post some answers on your website after, Jesse, if sure. people are interested. Sure. I don't know whether it's better to burn once or, or more for bindweed. Bindweed is, some people call it morning glory, is a species we do not want. So yeah, it, it's a, I pull it all the time here at my parents. Got it. Uh, any way to control or eradicate creeping buttercup? Okay. Um, Dave, have you, can, uh, I'll have to get you back the answer unless Dave Ralph wants to speak up to that. So I can get you an answer on that. I don't have that one. Thanks. Uh, what kind of influence does the uh, Invasive Species Council have to encourage communities, municipalities to manage invasive species within their areas? So we have no power, but we have influence. And we actually have a couple things that we do. So um, local, we have what's called a local government network. So when we started that eight, 10 years ago, and that's because many local governments don't know where to start. So we've already started with some tools like we've developed a, a local government guidebooks. We work with local government and realtors and developers say, here's some resources. So there's lots of um, tools that we have, and we're, we're just working on another project with our local government network. So my comment would be is if you're in a town and you're, and you're working for the government or whatever, or working for the local government, link into us and we'll connect you up with other local government people to find out what they're doing. And there's work being done by, by ourselves, but also there's lots of, uh, there's a dozen local uh, invasive species committees at local levels that are working with their local governments. So be in touch with us. We'll put you in touch with the resources like our local government toolkits and bylaws, et cetera. And we'll be, we've held sessions. We hold at least a couple of sessions a year for local governments about sharing what do you do with your bylaws? What's your process? What do you do for compost? And what do you do with knotweed? Knotweed's a hot topic. And by the way, none of that ever goes in the green, green waste. I'm going to stay strong on that message. Hey, great. Buttercup, okay, so from Dave. Buttercup management is more information than I can post here. We will get back to you. Okay, well, I'll keep track of all of these questions and I will... Uh, Gail, you're going to have even more work after the webinar than you did before. <laughs> okay, no problem at all. Uh, okay, uh, if there are any other questions, we're getting close to eight o'clock, but if anyone has any questions um, that they would like answered, now is definitely your time. And I guess in our world, Gail, you and I will have to connect. I mean, it's, uh, here we go. Okay.
Okay. Where can you dispose of invasive plant species during a fire ban, like scotch broom, blackberries, ivy, daphne? So many local governments actually have, uh, and this is a tool, not all, local, every local government is different and we, we're working to share the resources, like what's the Caribou Regional District doing and what's the City of Smithers doing so we can share tools and approaches. But when you're looking, you don't, you don't want to burn these species anyway because they've got really viable seeds that will sit there as a seed source for 20 or 30 years after you've burnt them. Some of them are really, really, really resistant to fire. So you want to, most, many local governments that, that are active on invasive plant management actually have a separate disposal system. It generally goes to landfill or the equivalent of landfill in your area. And I know that's, that's a tension point for people that have this logic of no green in the waste stream, which is a slogan that many local governments use. We want to say with the exception of invasives. And that's because um, you don't want to be burning those. You actually want to get them into, you want to get them out of action and into the, um, into your landfill or out of a place when they can't be dispersing more. I think that answered it, Jesse. Thanks. Uh, another one. I'm in my second year of trying to eradicate a 40 by 20 foot area of spotted knapweed from my property. Is the soil affected in any way that will inhibit successful planting of new native vegetation? So it's just going to take time and fertilizing you talked about earlier. So it, it can definitely strip your soil of some nutrients. So uh, stay at it. Um, if you have any challenges, let us know and we'll get back. To, we'll give you more details. But if it has, if you're in your second year and it's not coming back so thick here as it was in year one, you're making progress and invasive species take dedication. You can't just do a one or two year hit and go, okay, I've done my job. You have to have that continual work and you have to be able, in this case, um, if you, I think you were using knotweed. Is that the species this gentleman person was using? Um, b -b 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 spotted yeah. nap napweed. Spot napweed. Okay, so yeah, so they're probably not so well established if it's in your backyard or property. But yes, you can also add. You're now managing that site, so if you need to add some fertilizer, you can do that. So okay, awesome. Uh, how can we get landowners to take more responsibility to in address invasive species on their property? Well, um, I'll do. Call, we'll our organization will do seminars like this anytime for that because we think, you know. 15 years ago, invasive species was not a common word and not a common thought. Now that has changed. And I think the way we can get landowners taking action is by talking to your neighbors, by talking to you. Do you have a neighborhood association? Does your local government have a, a policy on, on invasives? The more we talk about it, the more we'll be aware. So I think we can do, we can all make a difference in increasing awareness. And that's why like we have lots of tools and, and apps and stuff connect in with us we've got volunteer programs resources and if you're looking for something to convince your neighbors give us a call we'll line you up with somebody we'll either line you up with the local government in that area that's doing something or a local committee or or a contact so uh peer pressure is a big difference and when you see our programs like plant wise it's actually based on a lot of science and research that says if we give people positive options we know that people generally will do something good. So that's why our language is very positive, giving people hope and opportunity. Well, that's great. That's an hour worth of talking for you. So maybe we'll we'll cut it off there. And I've got a bunch of questions here that I'll get uh, emailed off to you. Uh, we did have a few questions. Where is this available? It'll be available on our Facebook page. It's live right now. So it can be shared there if you're on Facebook. And there'll be a recording on the BCWF website and also on our YouTube channel here shortly. Uh, so you can share that with your peers, coworkers, family, friends, relatives, all those kinds of people. Um, Gail, I really want to thank you. Awesome topic. Lots of interest. Um, definitely think we need to keep working together and stay in touch as these problems become bigger, not smaller, especially as we talk about forest fires and post-fire management and all those things and all the concerns that come with invasive weeds so thank you so much um for thank everyone for else me. yeah anytime for everyone else thanks for tuning in we really appreciate it uh the next one is we're switching gears a little bit it's going to be actually around bill c21 it's dr noah shorts from the university of fraser valley that is on july 19th thanks everyone for coming out we really appreciate it hope there was lots of education here and uh Hopefully, yeah, we see, I see a few people who are adding your website, Gail, to their list of favorites. So that's great. Awesome.
Have a great night. Okay. Thanks. You too. Thanks.